morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our viewers from around the world. Thank you all for joining us today for the Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. Sally Benson and I will co-host this dialogue. So let me start by framing the discussion. One of the most striking features of today's energy and climate landscape is how the corporate world is making climate commitments and thereby using its role, the influential role in society to address climate change. According to a study by the Natural Capital Partners, as of September 2019, roughly 25% of Fortune 500 global companies had made some kind of commitment with 2030 or 2050 goals. Of the $32 trillion of total revenues of Fortune 500 companies, ones that have made the climate com commitments add up to about $10 trillion, roughly half the US GDP. And these companies employ 18 million people. By all means, this is a massive movement, which is likely to grow in the next decade. What impact will this have on the world? Will these corporate actions have a positive or a negative effect on social equity, labor, and other social aspects of this energy transition? And will it move the needle on the global carbon footprint? Sally? So thank you, Arun, and uh, uh, hello to everyone here. Um, to address these issues, we are so fortunate to have a very special guest, Dr. Lucas Jopa, the first Chief Environmental Officer of Microsoft. Lucas received a PhD in ecology from Duke University in 2009 and joined Microsoft where he started AI for the Earth program in 2017, a five-year, $50 million cross-company effort dedicated to delivering technology-enabled solutions to global environmental challenges. Under his leadership and that of his CEO, Satya Nadella, Microsoft announced that by 2030, it would be carbon negative on an annual basis, and it would be carbon negative on an annual basis by 2050. I'm sorry, it would by 2050 remove all the carbon that it had ever emitted into the atmosphere since 1975 when it was founded. Microsoft also started a $1 billion climate innovation fund to accelerate global development of carbon reduction, capture, and removal technologies. Now to warm everybody up, we'd like to start with our first poll. So if you could pull that up, that would be great. Okay, so according to Microsoft, how many millions of tons of carbon does it expect to emit this year? 4 million tons, 8 million tons, 16 million, or 32 million? Okay, we'll give you a little bit of time. Okay, all right. Oh my goodness, you're all too smart. That is in fact uh, the right answer. Uh, 16 million tons. I'm kind of guessing some people might have Googled that actually. Anyway, these emissions fall into three different categories. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions you emit when, for example, when you drive a car, a gasoline car. Scope two emissions are those indirect emissions that come from the production of electricity and heat that you use. And scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all of the other activities from, that you're engaged in, including emissions associated with producing the food you eat uh, and manufacturing the products you buy. So that's gonna set up our next quiz. Uh, okay, if you could pull that. So again, according to Microsoft, roughly what fraction of Microsoft's emissions are scope three emissions? 26%, 49%, 67%, or 75%. Wow, okay, we had a real divergence of opinions. Uh, the, the largest was 49%, it looks like, uh, followed by 75%. Yeah, so the, the real answer is 75%. And I think this is something that surprises everyone because if you look at your own emissions, at least for me, my scope three emissions are certainly the, the largest single source of emissions. And what's, is what's tricky is, is they're hidden from us, really. So, uh, so now let's move on with the dialogue. I just uh, also like to say that Rebecca Grecken, a graduate student at Stanford University, will also be joining us in this dialogue soon. And Arun, back over to you. Well, thank you, Sally. Um, Lucas, welcome and thanks for joining us. 
we will go into the details of scope one, scope two, scope two and scope three emissions. But before we do that, maybe you could explain to all of us the principles that you developed to, uh, in underlying the Microsoft commitment, the rationale behind its timing and its outlook. And maybe you could also connect the dots between your energy, climate, water, and waste goals that you have comprehensively put together. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks for thanks for having me on the uh, on the conversation. It's a it's an important one. I tried to uh, I tried to participate in the poll, but I found out that panelists weren't allowed to um, weren't allowed to participate. Otherwise, I I would have hoped we would have scored higher on that second um, on that second question because this is something that we pay a lot of attention to at Microsoft. So just to set the scene, I think a little bit um, from our perspective in, in Microsoft on, on sustainability, you know, at the, we'll get into all of this, I'm sure in the conversation at the highest level though, you know, we ask ourselves or we think about our business um, through a simple need, which is that if Microsoft's going to do well, we need the world to do well. And so then we go out and we look at things that might stop the world from doing well. And as soon as you start looking uh, through um, that lens, you immediately identify, even if you're in the private sector, even if you're just you know, a company making stuff and selling stuff, you immediately identify that climate change is one of, if not the single top issue that will stop the world from doing well moving forward, economically, socioeconomically, and from the perspective of growing the overall human experience. And so that's why we're focusing on, on sustainability because the world needs it and, and we need it. Uh, when we stepped back about a year ago, we've been looking at uh, and investing in sustainability for quite a while, but we stepped back about a year ago and we asked ourselves, are we doing enough? Um, are we up to date with the best available science, et cetera? And what do we truly need to do to do our part to ensure that the world does well so that Microsoft can do well? And you know what we came back with was we were quite proud of what we'd achieved, but it was pretty clear, like anybody who's introspective about sustainability and climate challenges, that we weren't doing enough. We decided to really... Um, double down on the issue. We put together a, a new strategy focusing on what I think of as kind of the four pillars of environmental sustainability and, and, and climate uh, moving forward, carbon, water, waste, and, and ecosystems and the biodiversity that those ecosystems are comprised of. And over the past year, we've worked to set ambitious commitments in each of those four areas. And we can talk about them and I will talk a lot about carbon. Uh, but those four, the commitments that Microsoft has set are that by 2030, we will operate as a carbon negative, water positive, zero waste company that's building the foundations, the technology foundations of uh, what we're calling a planetary computer platform so that we can better monitor, um, model, and then ultimately manage those natural systems because that's at the root of the, the problems that, that we're facing today. So that's the broad sweep of what we're looking to do on sustainability at Microsoft. And carbon, we led with carbon and our carbon negative commitment because it really is that first order consideration that we all have to focus on if we are going to do what we need to do, which is stabilize our climate systems. Okay, Sally? Okay, thank you. So, uh, so let's dig in a little deeper on, on some of your plans. Um, so to reduce your scope one and scope two emissions, uh, Microsoft will trans, uh, transition to 100% renewable energy by 2025. And the question is, is this 100% renewable every second of, of, of every day of every year, you know, sort of measured on a gigawatt basis, or is it 100% renewable energy on an energy basis where you allow yourself to, to take credit for offsets as an example? Sure, it's a great question. And so scope one, I'll, I'll get to scope two in a second. Scope one is, you know, by of the 16 million, we're at about 100,000 um, uh, is, is our scope one. And one of the things that we're doing is, uh, even though that's small for us, investing quite a lot to drive that down as close to zero as we can. So one of the commitments that we made as part of our carbon negative commitment is to actually um, completely electrify our campus vehicle fleet, for instance, 
Um, and that ties into this broader idea of electrification and the procurement of that electricity or that energy through low to no carbon sources or often what, what people would think of as, as renewables more broadly. And as part of that, as you mentioned, we have set this commitment to move to 100% renewable energy powering our entire global business by 2025. So what does that actually mean? And am I satisfied with it? Uh, should the world be satisfied with it? I would say that I am satisfied with it as much as I can given where the world is today, but it's not you know, what the world should be satisfied with moving forward. And that's because independent of you know, how people, different people's strategies on how they procure renewable energy, uh, what we need to be moving towards is ensuring that 100% of the electrons that enter our facilities come from zero carbon energy sources 100% of the time. And to be super clear, that's not what's happening at Microsoft and that's not what's happening anywhere. Because for that to happen, you need one of two things to happen. Either you need to be directly connected to renewable energy generation, solar, wind, hydro, that's you know, piped or, or cabled directly into your operations and you need backup energy storage to be able to ensure that you're able to still you know, store and then utilize that energy as, you, um, as, the, as the renewable energy generation flows. Um, or you need 100% renewably powered grids. And there's not much, there are no 100% renewable powered grids and nobody with 100% renewable energy goals is doing that entirely through directly connecting to renewable power generation. And so what happens is you go and you, you do these deals, these direct power purchase agreements, where you agree to purchase an additional, additional amount of energy or you agree to match the amount of energy that you are consuming every year, you commit to purchasing that same amount of energy and bringing that onto the grid where it's then mixed, right? With all the other electrons. So it's not like the 100% renewable energy that you bought is 100% of the time coming into your facilities, but it's an important path on the route to what I think is the most sustainable, resilient of those two options that I presented which is greening the grid, ensuring that you have a zero carbon grid. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we do. That's what we're working on. The question then is annual versus, you know, uh, out daily, hourly minutes. Um, what we've been working on is trying to move towards a world where you're able to um, use technology to match energy consumption with renewables on the grids you know, minute by minute. We had a pilot that we, um, that we rolled out with Vattenfall um, doing that where you could call 24 seven matching um, tool that allows consumers or, or, or users to, to do that themselves. Um, but, it's, but it's tricky business because you have to, you know, of course, know when all that energy is coming on, be able to secure those contracts, write those contracts, complete the, you know, close those contracts all on the spot market. Um, but but it's all work that's underway. Yeah, well, that's terrific. That's a great, uh, great discussion of the issue. And, and I agree, it's really hard to second by second have, you know, 100% clean energy. Um, but, but I think raising awareness of these issues is really uh, constructive. And, you know, we all know where we're heading. So thanks for that. Uh, so Arun, back over to you. Sure, um, Lucas. So as, as we know, building energy efficiency is a big deal because yep. you want to reduce the overall consumption of buildings so that your renewables are actually catch up or keep up. So Microsoft announced as part of your goal is that your Silicon Valley and Puget Sound campuses will have buildings that will follow the LEED Platinum rating certification mm -hmm. and zero carbon certification from the International Living Future Institute. So as you may be aware, LEED ratings are really only for design. And there are lots of data out there that you, when you actually go and measure the performance of lead rated buildings with lead platinum, lead gold, they have very little correlation with the actual rating. Yeah. And so the question is, will you be measuring the performance 
of these buildings? Will you be disclosing? Will you be, you know, reporting that it actually meets the LEED standards? Uh, yeah. So first, um, you know, we will be uh, ensuring that they meet the LEED standards. I think, but that doesn't get to the, your your ultimate concern. You know, that's that's uh, not your ultimate concern. Um, look, I'll give you a longer answer, but the short answer is that I think that these certifications, like LEED have played and will play an important role in providing the directional signal in which we need to go and some of the design standards that can help accelerate us on that path. But if we are going to properly stabilize our climate systems, it's going to require a true accounting of our carbon emissions and removal. And to do that, we are going to have to move away from estimates and towards actuals. What you're saying is these lead standards are really an estimate and they're not a good estimate, right? Um, I'm not gonna you know, defend or, or deny the, the lead standards. It's not gonna be my hill to, uh, to die on. But I do think that the design standards make play an important role, but that to your point cannot be where things stop. You need then to actually measure the outcome because that's what the, you know, the intent of the whole thing was in the, in the first place. And then you need to both manage against it to improve the outcome and report against it so that people can understand your progress. On both of those issues, you, know, you asked, will we? And the answer is yes and yes. So on the reporting side, we do include all of our building-based emissions. And you're right, buildings account for something like 40% of global emissions. Um, they're a huge wedge in the, in, the emissions, uh, in the emissions pie that we need to work on. And we need to be transparent about the progress that we're making there. So as part of our reporting, um, longstanding reporting, we disclose all of our scope one, two, and three emissions and, and then the categories of those emissions um, as part of the CDP platform, which is many of you are, are well familiar with kind of an industry standard, a private sector standard reporting platform for disclosing carbon emissions. But we're also working to digitize and then, um, and then better manage the, the buildings that we operate. So we have like 33 million square feet or something like that of, of real estate around the world, 600 locations, 112 countries. Um, here in Puget Sound alone, we're doing a two and a half million square foot uh, construction project. And so when we think about how we manage all of that, we really you, we, we have some principles, some design standards, and we also have some tools that can help us meet our objectives. So the design, the, the, the principles really kind of come in three tiers, which is if you have a project less than 75,000 uh, square feet, we have about 34 design principles that are intended to put you on path to a low carbon um, outcome. If you're above 75,000 feet of a remodel or something like that, you're required to achieve um, uh, lead gold and many more internal design standards. And if you're doing any new construction, then you need to build to lead platinum, something like close to 50 internal design standards and ensure that you're aligned with our overall carbon negative goals. And you can do that with some of the tools that we've, that we've developed. And so, you know, we have a, um, we have a smart buildings platform that we use ourselves. We, you know, we put into the market, but we're a customer of it ourselves. It's, it's reduced using that tools, reduced our building uh, energy consumption 25%. Um, over the past couple of years already. We also have a tool called the EC3 tool that was um, developed in partnership with a construction partner, Skanska and the University of Washington here uh, locally at our headquarters. And what the EC3 tool is for is for estimating the embedded carbon in all of the construction materials that you're using so that not just you, but all of your, your general contractors and everyone else can truly understand not just the financial cost of the materials that you're selecting as part of your procurement process, but the environmental and the carbon costs of those choices as well. Because that opacity, that carbon opacity in the markets is really what has stopped well-intentioned people, I think, from being able to achieve the, the, the aspirations that these lead certifications represent. Well, this is fabulous because I think, as, as you know, the building industry, the construction industry is highly fragmented. And it needs a building owner and enterprise to really drive the integration across all these fragmented segments. 
And I, I think what you're doing is absolutely fabulous. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. I'm you know this is really applauding your efforts, but also raising the bar, frankly, because the, as I said, I mean the, the lead rating, as as you said, also the lead ratings are necessary, but not sufficient. And I think if you could raise the bar for enterprises of reporting, which is only required, by the way, in New York City and a few other places, most yeah. of the places you don't even know what the buildings consume. So I think that setting the bar for enterprises really would send a signal to a lot. And I don't know if you plan to open up your codes and you know, your, your toolbox yeah. to, you know, for smart buildings, et cetera, for as openly, if you, I don't know if you plan to do that, but if you do that, I mean, that really enables a lot of other people to do so as well. Yeah, and that, I mean, so that, that tool is obviously out there in kind of the commercial market. The EC3 tool is open um, and, and shared widely. I think this gets to something that is really important to me because I spend a lot of time thinking about the practical logistics of how you take you know, these sorts of conversations or how, you, how do you take an aspiration like carbon negative and implement it on the ground. And it all sounds kind of easy and straightforward. And I love myself a whiteboard as much as anybody. Um, but the issue then is, okay, how do you actually, I mean, we've all, at least driven by, if not been on, you know, construction sites, if you've ever, you know, been more deeply involved, uh, and this is far from my area of expertise, but you see how complicated it is. You see the many, the, the contractors, the subcontractors, the general contractor, then ultimately the owner, you know, that is, that is driving the whole thing. And everybody can be well-intentioned, but if the systems and the processes aren't in place, it makes it really difficult for people to make the right choices all the way down the line. And so it's really important that we integrate that into, of course, the, the, um, the upfront mandate of a project, but it's also important that we implement it in the processes through which the project will be implemented. I think that, you know, we often kind of forget that second step and then we become discontented with the outcome, which, which you know, you're, you're representing on the, on the kind of the lack of correlation. And I would, I guess all I'm saying is I wouldn't, I would highlight that. I think, I don't, I don't think that scatter plot that, that you sometimes see um, between, you know, lead certification and, and energy efficiency is a result of people not wanting to see the full outcome. I think it's oftentimes a, a scarcity of tools and an underinvestment in the process, not the ambition. Thanks. Um, Sally, over to you. Okay, let's uh, move on to one of my uh, favorite topics these days, uh, scope three emissions. And you know, you, you've said that this is the majority of your emissions, but the reality is, is these are really difficult to estimate. And at Stanford University, we've now undertaken an effort to do this. And I was just curious, what framework are you using for calculating uh, scope three emissions? And you know, is that something that you are willing to share? Because again, that would be immensely valuable. Yeah, and let's get, let's get into this. I would just say the scope three bit about people being surprised that scope three is um, often makes up the majority of, of any organization or individual's emissions. You know, for me, it's, it's, it's not a surprise. Like, you know, I come from, I studied wildlife ecology and then ecology. And so, and, you know, besides Aldo Leopold being kind of the first environmental luminary that I, that I read, it was Rachel Carson, right? And what do you learn in, when, you, when you read about um, the concerns that Rachel Carson uh, uh, brought to light? It's about bioaccumulation, right? It's about accumulation up the trophic chain. Mm -hmm. And as a consumer, as an individual, you sit at the top of the trophic or the consumption chain. And so it should not be a surprise that you are accumulating emissions all the way up to you because you sit at the top of the food pyramid. And many organizations do as well. Those that don't are those that produce the raw materials, right? So there are organizations where scope one is significantly greater than scope two, but those are at the base of the pyramid. Consumers and most service 
organizations or tech companies, they sit at the top. And so you have that accumulation. You are taking on the embedded carbon in all of the goods and the services that you procure to then ultimately you know, produce your, your good or service. How to um, calculate carbon emissions is such an interesting and complicated uh, topic. Scope one, okay, it's your emissions. You should figure it out, right? You can do that from sensors. You can do that from sitting there uh, watching. You can do whatever you want. I don't care. Scope two, we've got a pretty good idea of the energy sources and the generation, um, you know, uh, et cetera, on the grid at any particular time. So you can kind of start figuring that out. Scope three is quite literally everything else. And, you know, the 15 categories of scope three that the International Greenhouse Gas Accounting Protocols um, classify are literally everything, basically everything. Um, business air travel, uh, procurement supply chain um, issues, end of life management of, of products that you may, um, that you may uh, sell all of that. And so if you look at the industry right now, I would say the most common conversation by far that I'm involved in is how do you accurately measure scope three emissions? One way that you do it is that ultimately there's somebody's scope one emissions. And so if we can drive reporting and if we can drive recording and then reporting down through the supply chain, then you have a system of record that you can start to, to, to manage against. And that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, so we recently announced um, a, uh, a change to our supplier code of conduct, uh, because, or our, our supplier contract, sorry. Um, which is basically the, the base supplier contract that applies to all of our procurement choices. And the change that we made is requiring emissions reporting, um, recording, uh, and then on path to reporting. Because we made a commitment as part of our carbon negative uh, commitment. We said that we would achieve that by reducing our emissions by half or more and removing the rest. We'll talk about carbon removal, I'm sure. But it's far from easy and it's far from cheap. The easiest lever that you have at your disposal is, is reduction. But 75% you know, of our emissions sit in this wild west of, of, of difficult carbon accounting. So we've got to get better at, at getting that all kind of into a, a carbon ledger so that we can start putting incentive programs like our internal carbon fee, which we charge across all of our full scope one, two, and three emissions and start letting that do its kind of do its job. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So to follow up on that. So okay, once you have an accounting of, of these scope three emissions, what kind of strategies are you pursuing to to begin to reduce those in a significant way? Well, so there's basically um, the two things that I that I mentioned, I think the first is we require <laughs> um, you know, reporting so that everybody knows. And then we put a cost, we put a price on carbon so that every bid that comes in will be weighted by the additional cost of the emissions associated with that procurement decision. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it. Um, we have a internal carbon fee. It historically was not um, applied against our scope three emissions. That was one of the big things about our carbon announcement and our carbon commitments that we issued back in January was that for the first time we included scope three in our ambitions. And what you'll see is if you look at a lot of corporate commitments, you hear things about carbon net zero, you hear things about carbon negative, you hear things about carbon neutral. Um, and, but m the majority of those commitments to date cover scopes one and two, which can be you know, relatively small. So, and, and historically that's what Microsoft did as well. That was one of the things that we really realized about um, 
what we needed to do better is we needed to put scope three in there. And then once you do that, you just have to manage against it in the same way that you manage against any constraints inside the private sector, which is you just need to put a, a corporate target and then you need to put, you know, the most powerful uh, incentive, which is a financial cost savings incentive inside the company and, and let things play out. And if the incentive's not working, then you just need to raise it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Really interesting. Uh, Ruben, back to you. Yeah, good. So by the way, to all the people in the audience, there's some great questions coming in. So feel free to type in your questions and we will be asking those, you know, shortly. So um, let's get into negative emissions because, you know, Microsoft wants to be, you know, negative emission on an annual basis by 2030, so as to meet the 2050 goal, which is, which is, makes a lot of sense. And you have stated in your, in your um, public announcements that you'll first want to start with natural climate solutions, which also makes a lot of sense. And this, of course, goes back to your roots in ecology. Um, so we recently had a workshop on natural climate solutions um, and the September 30th dialogue of the Global Energy Dialogue was dedicated to atmospheric carbon removal. As you know, I mean, approaches such as reforestation, afforestation, or soil carbon sequestration, they, these are really fraught with uncertainties of how much carbon you actually sec sequestered. So how do you plan to address that issue to be sure you've actually met your goals? Yeah, it's a great question. It's the question. There's two, there's two ways to remove carbon from the atmosphere, nature-based solutions and technology-based solutions, and they each have an existential question that they have to address. Nature-based solutions has to address um, how you know how much carbon has been sequestered and how you ensure its permanence or the durability of its sequestration. Engineered-based solutions have to answer the question of how do you drive the price down and how do you drive the volume up? So we look at both of those areas and thus we look at those four questions that, that we think that we have to answer. Um, as we said in January, nature-based solutions need to play an important role in our carbon removal efforts, but so do technology-based solutions. Um, and you have to operate in this space in a way that's kind of cognizant of the reality on the ground, but with your eye on the prize for what the market really look, needs to look like um, 10 years from now. And I just want to circle back really quick and talk about why Microsoft is talking about carbon removal. And because, again, when many companies are, are talking about... Um, are talking about net zero, et cetera, what they're really talking about is the use of avoided emissions, um, avoided emissions offsets or other types of investments. And that's actually something that Microsoft did for a long time. We were one of the earliest, largest corporate buyers of avoided emissions offsets over the past decade. And we really helped drive and grow that market significantly. What's really interesting about removal markets is just how under kind of un immature they are, how low the volume is and how now, particularly since we made our commitment and others have, have followed, how oversubscribed they are um, and how opaque they are. So one of the things that Microsoft did is on our path to 2030 and having to procure, if you take kind of the letter of the commitments, 50% or more, so that would mean we'd have to remove, um, say we reduced our emissions 50%, that means we'd have to remove um, you know, somewhere like uh, 6 million um, metric tons or so by 2030 annually. That means that um, we got to get started now. So we issued an RFP for a million metric tons. It was the largest uh, procurement RFP for carbon removal ever. Uh, and we said, hey, we're going to actually publish all the non-confidential parts of the proposals that we get. The world needs to know what this market looks like. We don't even know what this market looks like, and we're trying to buy out of it, right? And what you learn is that a couple really interesting things for those that are interested in economics and whether or not you know markets can solve some of our problems is that we know, for instance, nature-based solutions. 
we know the potential wildly outstrips the current availability. And we know that the market wildly outstrips the current availability. That is an exciting time if you're interested in the economics of, of these situations. If you're interested in the technical details, it's a worrying time because we don't yet have all of the certification systems at scale. We don't have the technology monitoring at scale to ensure that these um, programs are, are going to um, remove the carbon that they say they are going to and that they're going to sequester it on time periods that we need it sequestered. Here on the West Coast, I mean, Stanford uh, folks, local Stanford folks, you know this better than, than meant not all, but most, which is that um, you know trees can burn, and as climates change, more trees can burn in more places. And if those trees are being used or traded in climate stabilization, then we have to be able to account for that. We have to be able to ensure the risk of that, uh, and we still have a long way of go, long way to go um, to do that. So, so what you're saying is really that notwithstanding the uncertainties, we need to move forward, and which is what Microsoft is doing. We need to move forward and creating and explaining and being transparent about these markets. And yes, we have to figure out the uncertainty and, and, and that there needs to be focused on that. Did, did I get that right? There's no other choice. I mean, what, right. what, what academic is, an, is running experiments that they know will work? Right, like I mean, if if you know it's good, like it's not an experiment. Like why, you know? I mean, you've got to try, and you've got to see what's wrong with your original hypothesis, and you need to debug it. Yeah. Right. Like no, it's, it's, is, it's delightful to hear that you know Microsoft is willing to do some experiments, which is great, absolutely great. Well, it's interesting. I mean, this is what people <laughs> I think are like, oh, I can't believe you're doing experiments. I'm like, we write all we do at Microsoft is write code. All writing code is, is, is an experiment. Now, you're following principles, right? And you're following best practice. But this is why there's an entire profession of software debugging, right? This is why there's a massive toolkit out there to do that, because nobody writes perfect code all the time, every time. And so you write the code, you run it. Does it compile? No. Why not? OK, let's figure it out. And then you keep going and ultimately you build something um, just like we built Windows a long time ago. But it's not like we built Windows a long time ago and then stopped, right? We're still building Windows. Uh, and, um, and so anyway, I, I, we're bringing that same perspective uh, to this issue. And, and I just think everybody needs to do that. I think, yeah, it's just for us when people are like, well, we don't know it'll work, so we shouldn't do it. And I'm like, well, Okay, yeah. like, like, how are we gonna find out that it works then? And they're like, well, we won't, but we need to do it. And I'm like, all right, I don't like, I don't know how to get right. through that thicket. Sally? Okay, yeah, so, so we talked a little bit about um, natural climate solutions for negative emissions. Let's talk about some of the engineered solutions that, that you're also um, planning to pursue. So one of them is bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage. And while there's not a lot of that deployed today, you know, we know how to produce power with, by burning biomass and, and we know how to capture carbon and so forth. So that's relatively mature. But, but the second of these that, you know, there are really high hopes on uh, direct air capture. Um, and, you know, direct air capture is a very energy intensive process. You know, you're trying to take a, a molecule out of the atmosphere that's present in a very, very low uh, low concentration. So, so to what extent do you think that that this you know that's a risk to pursue this you know put so much stake in something like direct air capture, which is really quite immature, and you know will it really end up being cost competitive? And what's our, our plan B if it if it's not? Well, I think you know this answer is my answer here is a is a nice transition. I think from the from the conversation Arun and I were just having, which is is there a risk? Of course, right? And we know it's too expensive. We know it's I mean, partly because it's so inefficient. Um, even if we can get that efficiency down, the energy that it's consuming, we need to be able to ensure comes from zero carbon sources. Otherwise you're just kind of compounding the problem. 
And, you know, we, the basic physics of it make it hard. I mean, who, who gets excited about, you know, having to scale up a process that has to find 400 parts per million? I mean, that's not that fun. It's not that easy. Um, and that's kind of that, like the irony of CO2 is that for our climate, 400 parts per million is catastrophically high. But for chemistry and removal, 400 parts per million is catastrophically low, right? So look, that's the, that's the dilemma that we've got to find our way through. But look, why, why, why are we also pursuing nature-based solutions? Because evolution has already figured out a scalable process to find 400 parts per million and to put it to use, right? It's called photosynthesis. So we need to take the tools that evolution has provided and we need to bring our tools to bear to make sure that we can properly manage biology, that it's you know, performing the way that we want it to. And then we have to take our tools and hopefully what we've learned from biology and be able to you know, artificially replicate it um, over on a pure engineering side. Am I confident that direct air capture is this, you know, the silver bullet, the solution to our challenges? No. Uh, am I confident that afforestation and reforestation is the answer to our challenges? Absolutely not. That's why I think you will see our portfolio have a mix of those types of solutions. You will see us look to grow the scale and the, the assurance of nature-based solutions. And you will look to see us drive down the cost and the efficiency um, of, of direct air capture. Uh, I, I, one of the things that worries me is we, we know this is a complex system we know there's many interdependent parts, but we often insist on having a singular one dimensional conversation, you know, a conversation about one dimension at a time. And that's a really difficult way to approach this. I mean, for all of you in the audience that maybe have more of an optimization background, you know, that's not how you kind of go about solving this for society. It's one of the, one of the things that I've been talking about a lot is um, you know what is what is the human uh, species objective function for life on Earth? What are we trying to achieve? Like, can you mathematically quantify that? Because if you could put that into an objective function, then I could optimize for it, and I could take into account all of these considerations. You mentioned Bex. Bex is a great example of how to combine technology and uh, biology, right? Biology is hyper-efficient at capturing carbon, of removing carbon, and technology can be hyper-efficient at extracting energy from that, from that biomass and then capturing the carbon, sequestering it. Okay, great, but Bex or any other land use uh, system is in direct competition with other critical societal needs, uh, food production, human, um, uh, housing and, and other things. And so as soon as you start talking about that, people say, well, what about land use expansion? And that's not going to work. And my point is we have to have the whole conversation all at once. And we have to have an objective function that we are trying to achieve. And then we can put the constraints on the problem, financial, geometric, uh, moral and ethical, whatever you want. And then we could actually optimize for it. But, but, trying to do this in a, you know, you know, one at a time way is, is just going to crush us. Well, great. That, that's a grand challenge uh, laid out for uh, many, many a PhD, I think, is uh, to do that. So, so maybe you could just say a little bit about your, your recently formed partnership with Gas Nova. I was speaking to Trude Sunset last week, uh, the CEO there. And, uh, and she mentioned that you would uh, joined, formed a part partnership with them for carbon sequestration. Could you say a little bit about more about that? Would you capture the carbon and, and they would store it? Or you know, what, what, what's your thinking along those lines? Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting that we announced last week, or two weeks ago, something like that, um, is a project up in Norway 
a partnership with a project up in Norway called Northern Lights. And Northern Lights the, is, is this really interesting um, project that has the potential to really position that region as the sequestration um, reservoir really for e captured emissions across, uh, across Europe and, and that region of the world. And it's, a, you know, it's about using the, um, the infrastructure that's been developed for so long to, to sequester uh, or to extract hydrocarbons to, to kind of reverse that process and put captured carbon back into geological uh, sequestration. Um, that is, you know, basically the holy grail of carbon sequestration. You know, if you wanted the, the you know, at the limit theoretical kind of holy grail, it's that we somehow figure out a hyper efficient way to capture carbon through the atmosphere, from the atmosphere using purely technological sources and that's powered as efficiently as possible with zero carbon energy. And that captured carbon is then immediately injected into geological formations uh, and sequestered on, you know, 10,000 plus year time horizons. That's, that's the, you know, the, the holy grail. Um, we're a long way from each component of that. We already talked about the risk, et cetera. But um, the opportunity to sequester carbon at those geological timescales with that level of assurance, that's what's super exciting about what's going on up there in, um, in Norway. And then, you know, from a technology perspective, we're really interested from a platform perspective. If we're good, I, I said this at the beginning, if we're going to stabilize our climate, we're going to have to record and report our the entire kind of carbon ecosystem. And then we're gonna to have to manage it. I happen to believe that that represents not just a significant technology challenge for a company like Microsoft, but a huge opportunity for our business and for society. Great, thank, thank you, really interesting. Arun, back to you. Sure. Um, so, uh, Lucas, Microsoft announced a billion dollar fund. Uh, Amazon announced a $2 billion fund. Google, Apple, Facebook, I'm sure, are announcing, making announcements, uh, which is great. This is terrific. Um, and then Bill Gates has, um, you know, breakthrough energy, enterprise, venture being the for profit, and there are probably more money in the nonprofit on the other side, you know, matching sort of getting to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this is, if you look at around, across the whole corporate world and the philanthropic world, this is big. So my question to you is, how much coordination is there between Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google, et cetera, to make the whole of that bigger than the sum of the parts? Uh, because in this case, you may be competing on the tech side, mm -hmm. but you're not competing on the climate change. So what is it that you're doing to bring everyone together? Yeah, we're absolutely not competing on the climate side. We absolutely are competing on the on the tech side, and as and, we should. <laughs> and may the yeah may the may the best corporation win, right? Uh, but and I, I firmly believe there's room for all of us and many many more to to come as well. But um, on the climate side, no, we're not competing at all. I, I you know, I think as a community, we're all pretty close uh, from the sustainability side. Well, just as companies, we all know each other very well. Uh, but on the sustainability side, we all know each other uh, and we're, we're pretty close. I think that uh, this actually, you know, the need for, for deeper uh, collaboration is why this past July, Microsoft announced a, a new um, uh, coalition called the Transform to Net Zero Coalition. And it's this coalition of nine companies, the, the companies that have kind of the most ambitious um, climate, uh, climate goals, um, you know, Nike, Starbucks, Unilever, th that kind of group of, of organizations that are putting together kind of the playbooks for any company 
to be able to follow in our footsteps and not saying, you know, well, not just follow in our footsteps uh, and know when to veer <laughs> from the path that we took um, so that they don't have to, you know, pay the price of the mistakes that we've made in, in our past. Um, so look, there's a lot of work uh, in, in, in um, that one individual company can play by bringing many other uh, companies together. You mentioned the fund. Um, there is a lot of different types of investment strategies. You know, Microsoft has its climate investment fund. Amazon has its climate pledge fund. Google just, you know, announced some really interesting um, sustainability bond strategies that they're deploying. And, and we work together on, on a lot of those. I think, you know, some of our recent climate innovation funds, um, we invested in uh, areas that, that, that Amazon led on. Uh, led the investment on and, and we followed and vice versa. So, you know, we don't all have the same needs uh, that the others do. Um, if you look at uh, Amazon, in some ways you can think of us as having similar businesses, but in other ways we're completely different organizations. Um, if you look at their supply chain issues, their retail businesses, you know, the, the, um, the commitments that they've made have, have replicated that. For instance, the, the um, electric vehicle, uh, delivery vehicle commitments that they made, you know, are, they operate at a different business and a different scale in that space than we do. So, and when we think about our fund, we look at first and foremost, we look at uh, climate impact, but we also look at where capital is needed because we are trying to be additional in this space, right? I think you're not seeing us go and pour our billion dollars in renewable energy projects that are already oversubscribed anyway. We're looking to close that kind of um, valley of death, that investment valley of death in the, I hate this term, but the clean tech space. Uh, apologies for those of you who like that term, but, um, but, you know, we need to, we see ourselves as a corporate fund is sitting in a relatively unique area because we can be both a customer and an investor and we don't have super risk tolerant capital, but we are capable of tolerating risk because of our size and success. So we don't need guaranteed outcomes like a lot of the late stage investment funds need. And so we just see ourselves operating um, in a fairly unique space, but when and where we can collaborate uh, with the rest of, of the both private and public sector that's investing, of course we do. Thanks, Lucas. I, I think we should move on to the student section. Sally, you want to introduce Rebecca? Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Rebecca Grecken. Uh, she's uh, pursuing her uh, master's degree here at Stanford in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering and happens to be part of my research lab. And for her, um, she got her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from MIT. And so she's currently working very closely with our Office of Sustainability to, uh, to quantify and develop strategies to reduce our scope three emissions. So uh, I'd like to turn this over to Rebecca who has some uh, student questions for you. Thank you, Sally and Arun. Hello, Lucas. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Our first student question is actually related to a lot of the attendee questions that we've gotten in the chat so far. Um, so how did Microsoft come up with the $15 per ton value for the internal carbon fee? Uh, it seems to be a little bit low on the, uh, on the low end, looking at other estimates for what a carbon tax should be. Um, and what have been some of the difficulties and successes that have come with implementing this internal carbon fee? Yeah, well, I could go on all day about our carbon fee and the successes and failures of it. I think that um, I'll give people a little bit of color uh, into why it's set um, where it is and, um, and, uh, and opportunities for improvement. So, but before I do that, I really wanna highlight the way that we think about a carbon fee. Um, we don't compare, uh, you know, what our carbon fee should be with what a projection for what, for instance, a governmental fee might need to be. 
Why? For two, and we don't benchmark against that. Uh, there's two real reasons for that. One, um, we have very different levers to pull than a government does, right? And the more direct the lever that you have to pull, generally the lower the financial um, uh, signal that you have to send. And so in some ways, I mean, it's kind of weird that a company has a carbon fee because we could just tell people what to do in a way that governments struggle to do a little bit more. Um, so we don't benchmark against, you know, what a government fee should be because a private internal fee versus a government fee are, are, exists in completely different systems. The second thing is that we're actually, we want to be lower than projected future fees. That's why we have a fee in some respects. That's in some ways why we're trying to get our carbon to zero or at least to zero because we want to avoid having to pay what will likely be significantly higher costs of carbon moving forward. I mean, this is what a business does, right? You try to get out ahead of what you see future costs being, and you try to avoid those costs by incurring lower costs today. And so I just hope, I, I want ever, I, I feel like that's always kind of like a, something that people don't, haven't considered about our internal carbon fee is, um, you know, I'm actually oftentimes, you know, I'm trying to drive to keep that as low as possible because I'm trying to keep costs as low as possible while achieving the carbon outcome that we're trying to drive. Um, and, and basically you want that carbon fee to be uh, enough to drive the carbon outcome and no more. And so when you think about our $15 fee, it was um, set when we were accelerating to 100% um, renewable energy. And it is, um, uh, you know, can, in some ways you can think about that as an important baseline uh, for what the fee needs to be to incentivize businesses to pursue that outcome. And then, you know, moving forward, you have to keep track with the cost of uh, carbon removal, both nature-based and, and, and technology-based, so that you're blended, so that you know, your carbon fee can ultimately cover your blended cost of, of carbon removal. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the perspective I hope everybody has on it. Thanks. Yeah, I had definitely not thought about all the all the stuff behind it in terms of a difference between a government and a corporation. So that was, that was very helpful. Well, I mean, one of the things, you know, is I get a lot of like, well, the IPCC says that, you know, the price on carbon may have to rise to $5,500, you know, a ton. And I'm, and there's a couple things about that. Well, yeah, if we do nothing today, then eventually the price is going to have to be so high that you may achieve, you know, you may extend yourself into outer space costs of $5,500 a ton, right? We don't want that to happen. That's why we have a fee today, right? Um, so I just think that people like, uh, I don't know, I, I often have these like apples and oranges conversations. I'm like, yes, that is why I have a $15 fee and maybe it will raise or maybe it'll lower, but I'm going to try to track the carbon outcome so that the world doesn't have to institute a $5,500 fee and my business is going to take some massive hit, right? Um, that's the perspective that we think about a fee through. It's not, we're not trying to, we're not trying to, you know, virtue signal through a carbon fee. We're trying to achieve an outcome. That makes a lot of sense. Um, another student question is, technology is not enough. The right policies need to be in place on a nationwide and global level to get all players actively working on sustainability if the world wants to meet the Paris Agreement. How is Microsoft planning on leveraging its power to help enact these types of policies? Well, we spend a lot of time um, engaging with governments around the world on this uh, here in the US, in the EU, and, and, and well beyond, um, as well as bringing our voice um, you know, singularly fantastic, but as part of coalitions of companies advocating for the right policy actions, and that's on the right policy actions to manage carbon, that's on removing regulatory barriers and, and incentivizing innovation and carbon 
um, removal and uh, you know, ensuring that co consumers, for instance, have transparency in the carbon, uh, embedded carbon of, of the products that they're, um, that they're uh, purchasing. And we strongly support uh, market and pricing mechanisms to get a lot of this done. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been part of all sorts of coalitions on, on getting carbon and, and supported lots of different bills on getting a price of carbon um, enacted, both at the state level. For instance, uh, a couple of years ago, Washington had Washington Initiative 1631 that would have put this in place. We're one of the only companies to sign on, the only large technology company to sign on. We're actively at lobbying on the Hill for this stuff. We're part of, um, you know, uh, quote unquote bipartisan, you know, coalitions of, of companies try, that all agree that there needs to be uh, uh, pricing and other uh, market mechanisms to get this done. Um, you know, we're trying to make our voice heard on, on this issue. It's obviously, you know, it's a really, it's a really thorny, thorny issue. Um, and while we can all argue that the policy should be enacted and we should, uh, that, that, that new policy should be enacted. We should all make that argument. We should also do the hard work of making it as easy as possible for robust policies to not just get passed, but to be implemented. And, um, you know, putting a price on carbon requires that you know how much carbon there is and that you can fairly price it and fairly charge, you know, fairly uh, charge for it. We just had a long conversation about scope three, for instance, and how difficult that still is. And so, um, you know, I think we need to be very cognizant of the logistics that need to go underneath any sort of meaningful market or pricing mechanism that would help, um, you know, states or countries, uh, uh, you know, manage, manage carbon emissions through a policy framework. Thanks for that. I think now we're going to uh, transition to a couple audience questions. So Arun. Um, well, okay, I think I'm going to take the first one there. So, uh, so, so you just mentioned earlier that you're building another, you know, set of large buildings up, up in Washington, and and you know, given your interest in carbon neutrality or net negative, you know, to what extent are you trying to uh, incorporate uh, building materials that could actually be carbon negative? Uh, into into your new uh, buildings and and the the uh, the person who wrote this question put forward graphene and CO two concrete as as uh, some possible things that may be uh, net negative. Yeah, those are those are um, those are obvious ones uh, that that we're pursuing low low um, uh, or or CO two embedded concrete um, is is really interesting where you can actually inject. Um, CO2 into, into concrete and it provides a lighter, uh, stronger concrete solution that, you know, embeds captured CO2 in it and stores it for, you know, a long time. Uh, another um, way to do that is kind of the construction equivalent of BEX, which is uh, cross laminated timber and ensuring that you are um, building with cross laminated timber. I think we've, we've invested a lot in this space. Uh, actually our Silicon Valley campus, which is nearing the tail end of construction is, uh, will be the largest um, cross laminated timber building by, by volume in the uni entire United States. And so, you know, we happen to believe that um, it creates kind of beautiful buildings, beautiful spaces, but it also allows you to use, again, biology and its efficiency to capture carbon and then technology and construction to sequester that carbon into infrastructure that will um, last maybe not on geological time scales, but at least on climate, socio-climate uh, relevant time scales, um, given that we have 50 years or, or you know, fewer to really get out ahead of these challenges. We're taking a cross-laminated timber approach um, 
here in our Puget Sound uh, rebuild as well. Uh, and that's part of our, our overall um, ambition to reduce the embedded uh, carbon in our, in our buildings by up to 30%. So, um, you know, th those are all things that you have to think about. Again, you've got to think about the full life cycle, cycle story. You know, here in the Pacific Northwest, where a significant part of our construction is going on, we're blessed with, you know, a lot of forests. Um, unfortunately, we're uh, also in close proximity to, you know, one of the more biologically devastating events that's been taking place in the United States, which is the pine um, bark beetle infestation that has is, that is caused, you know, unprecedented mortality events for, for forests across the West, which, um, you know, also have been contributing to the severity of our wildfires. But um, at the least in the spirit of, you know, if handed lemons uh, make lemonade, you know, one of the things that we're trying really hard to do is to ensure that, you know, the, the lumber that goes into this cross laminated timber that we use to build with is sourced from um, those, those dead and diseased forests so that we can take forests that otherwise, you know, would have been uh, considered a loss, um, both environmentally and economically, and, and integrate those in to our buildings. So, you know, all this stuff takes time. It takes a lot of work. But if you think about it hard enough and just keep chipping away at it, you can start doing all these things. And it's not just Microsoft that can do these things. Any organization can do these things. No, thank you. Uh, everyone, back to you. Actually, we'll go to Rebecca um, for your third question. Sure. Um, so, it's great to see a company working on sustainability while simultaneously accounting for environmental justice. Can you talk a little bit about how has integrating environmental justice changed how decisions get made and what steps Microsoft makes? Uh, that's a great question. I think um, we talk a lot about <clears throat> the energy and, carb and carbon and economic transition that the world is going to have to go through if we're going to achieve a net zero carbon economy by 2050. And I am firmly convinced that that transition will only occur if it's a just transition. If we bring along the people and the communities that have been either traditionally left behind or disenfranchised by the construction and operation of our energy and carbon systems of, of today. And so when we think about climate justice, we've, what we've, and, and climate equity and environmental justice, we've tried to really embed it as a key principle in, in all the things that, that we do for the climate fund. You know, what did I say? I said, we seek climate impact. We seek uh, underfunded or, or we, we seek, um, capital needs, we seek an integration with our own business needs, and we seek an environmental justice and climate equity outcome. Those are the four, you know, for our billion dollar fund, those are the things that we look about. When we look at, when we think about the, um, the other strategies that we're deploying, we think about, um, we think about our renewable energy procurement. One of the things that I was the most excited about, and this is, you know, all credit goes to our energy procurement team uh, on this because they really took the ball and ran with it, is to, uh, up until this summer, we had procured about 1.9 gigawatts of um, uh, renewable energy uh, over, over, over our past. And the big deal that we signed was a 500 megawatt deal, the biggest deal that we'd ever signed with an organization called Soul System. And that entire deal is for Soul Systems to deliver direct power purchase agreement, renewable energy projects to Microsoft, 500 megawatts of them in communities around the United States that have been traditionally underserved or, or, or lack, have achieved lack, not achieved appropriate representation kind of in the economic opportunities that, that the energy sector affords. When we um, announced a recent partnership actually with Alaska Airlines and Sky Energy to 
fuel our three most popular routes out of um, Puget Sound to San Jose, San Francisco, and Los Angeles with sustainable aviation fuel. Well, we do, you know, we have a carbon commitment that we have to meet, but the communities around large municipal airports are severely impacted by the particulate matter pollutants that come from traditional aviation fuel, that sustainable aviation fuel, you know, drives down. And so we think about these things and we prioritize them, um, but we cannot be the only ones. I think, uh, you know, the world has got to think about how everybody gets brought along. Otherwise, nobody's going anywhere. Yeah, I definitely agree with all that. Oops, go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> no, thanks, Lucas. So there have been wonderful questions from the audience, and thank you to the audience for, um, for sending these questions. We'll try to, what we'll do is we're packaging those into kind of themes, and we'll try to get through as, as many as possible. So this, the, the second audience question is, uh, is Microsoft educating employees regarding its efforts? And how does each employee can be, how, do they, how can they be personally responsible for their own footprint at work and in their personal life? How are you helping them do that? And is there a demand for that from your employees? Oh man, I don't think there's a demand for anything more than that uh, from employees. I think you see how, um, look, Microsoft has a young workforce, you know, uh, and, and there's no issue at the top of their minds like climate uh, and, and sustainability, both personally and professionally. Um, we have a, uh, a, we have this, this program inside Microsoft, uh, Worldwide Communities. And it's basically, um, you know, it's a formal mechanism for bringing all of our global employee workforce together on particular issues. And, and people self-identify and, and choose, you know, we have an AI community, for instance. Um, we have a sustainability community and it was both, it became the most rapidly growing and is now close to the largest community inside the entire company. And we did that in just a few, in like two years on, and I, I, I'm the executive sponsor of it, but the, the, it's all volunteers. It was started by a few dedicated individuals. Um, and they've done, they basically have two jobs. They have their real jobs and then they run, you know, basically the shadow workforce. Um, and so there's a lot of demand. We are always, yes, we are educating our, our employees. We, um, through that community, through our, you know, corporate all hands, our president, our, our CEO, CFO, um, are all speaking about these things consistently as are the rest of our executive vice presidents. Um, we try to provide opportunities. We have, for instance, um, uh, uh, initiative inside Microsoft called One Week, which is basically where everybody takes the week off of work and works on projects that they think will lead to new products or social impact or whatever gets them excited. Uh, sustainability was one of our top featured um, areas of, to work on and one of the most uh, frequently participated in. We actually just launched a, um, a Microsoft uh, Sustainability Eco Challenge uh, for our employees. I actually sent that email out yesterday. It went live. Uh, and where, you know, we're creating teams across the company to, for people to kind of, uh, you know, compete on their both personal and professional resource use reduction. Um, so we, we try, I would, all I would say is that there's no way I can I or Microsoft can keep up with employee demand in this space. I mean, and that's great, by the way, that's not a complaint. Uh, that's just the, the, the level of enthusiasm and demand is, is one that, um, one that just can't be, can't be satisfied. So Lucas, a quick follow up and maybe if you, if you could give us a quick answer, you are dealing not only with employees, you're dealing with your supply chain, you're dealing with customers and you're dealing with your shareholders and you have made um, you know, your carbon things public in your SEC filing and congratulations on all the earnings report yesterday. That was terrific. So you. if you look at the whole ecosystem, are you sharing, providing tools to your customers, your supply chain, your shareholders to drive the broader you know, decarbonization or sustainability efforts? Yeah, definitely. Look, I think that there's three, <clears throat> um, 
areas that um, that we can focus on and and products and services. One of the things I didn't talk about was the way that we run our sustainability strategy at Microsoft. I talked about carbon, uh, water, waste, and ecosystems, but those each those four pillar areas are each uh, support or four priority areas are each supported by five pillars: our operations, our products and services, customers and partners, policy and and employee engagement. So we've covered basically all of those things in our conversation, but. Um, the products and services thing, the way that I break this down is really, um, is really in three ways that we can help folks. We can, you know, ensure it's what I, I kind of um, alliterate a lot because I can't really, because uh, I can't really remember anything if I don't. So I call it kind of the three D's by default, by, by desire and by design. Right. And so I think the way that I think about it is that we should be building our products and services so that every customer, regardless of how much they care about sustainability or even know that sustainability is a thing, get the sustainability benefits of a Microsoft uh, investments in sustainability out of the box by default. So, and you, I think you think about things like 100% renewable energy of our, of our, um, of our data center fleet, you know, is, is one of those just things like that's just, you get it, you don't have to want it, but you're going to get it anyway. Um, by desire, that's really things like our Microsoft sustainability calculator, where we're providing Azure based tools for people to be able to understand the carbon impacts of their use of our technologies and then optimize or manage to reduce them. And then by design, a lot of this stuff is the, you know, the go to market partnerships that that we're creating to get new tools out into the into the hands of, of folks all around the world things like the ec3 tool for embedded carbon for construction and and others so we do kind of have a plan we're at the very Great. early stages of it so thanks and we have 10 minutes left so we'll go through some quick fire questions uh, rebecca Sure. So um, Microsoft has definitely set itself apart from other companies in terms of being a, a thought leader for sustainability. How can we as students encourage companies that we intern with or have just started working with to kind of follow in similar footsteps? Well, as soon as you join a company, look for its sustainability community and join and become a vocal part of it. Second, um, prioritize those companies that you choose to offer your talent and skills to prioritize those companies that are leading on climate issues that you're passionate about. And three, as students, think hard about the type of profession and career that you're going into, the skills that you're gaining, and ensure that you have a plan for how that is going to be relevant to solving our climate challenges. I do not mean go and become an environmental scientist. I mean, Look at whatever it is that you want to do, what, whoever you want to be, and ensure that you have a plan that that makes the world a more environmentally sustainable place and helps stabilize our climate. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, so can the tools you're using for scope three emissions help quantify the embedded um, emissions with imports? Can we track the you know, international supply chain with where the carbon's coming from? I, yeah, I mean, I think that that kind of gets put part and parcel in how you do scope three. The bigger question then becomes, you know, how you handle uh, cross-border carbon adjustments and all sorts of things. And that's that goes back to the logistics about policy is those are the types of policy conversations that people are having. But until that we have until we have the tools to be able to do that, it's going to get uh, a lot more difficult or it's going to be a lot more difficult. Maybe one final question, and this is from one of the audience members. Recently, um, Republican Senator Murkowski and Democratic Senator Whitehouse uh, agreed that tech companies have been notably quiet on policy front. And this was a, a discussion actually on Stanford platform. Um, and, uh, and they're not providing a counterbalance to the climate position of the US Chamber of Commerce. Do you think that this will uh, change? And if so, when do you think this will change? Well, you know, I guess I appreciate the, their position on this. I, I don't think we're being quiet um, at, at all. I mean, you know, we, I can't go into all the details of the outreach and the communications that we have with our publicly elected officials, but we are not quiet about these issues. Um, we let everybody know 
how we feel about them. When we make announcements, we ensure that we set up time to do deep dives with our elected officials to ensure that they understand not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it and the policy um, issues that, that they would like to see. So, you know, to the extent that we're in the tech sector and, and that's a general comment, I think that that's, I don't know if that's true or false. I guess that's an opinion of, of theirs. Um, but for Microsoft, you know, this is something that we're constantly talking with folks about um, whether or not our voice is enough of a counterbalance to, you know, other institutions um, in, in the minds of those who are being lobbied. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but, but the only thing that we can concentrate on is, is, is being as loud and also as sincere as possible. Um, and bringing solutions, not just stating our desire, but proposing solutions on how that desire could be fulfilled in a way that's, you know, fair and equitable for all. Lucas, thank you so much. I mean, this has been, uh, we really applaud the efforts of Microsoft in, in, in doing what it, you know, in really planning this out carefully, thoughtfully, and laying out the roadmap for the next, you know, really 30 years. And you know this is this is wonderful to see that happen, and and I hope that you know sets a benchmark for others as well to join, uh, because this is a real issue. I mean, this will affect everyone, every human being. It is the defining issue of the 21st century. Would you like to just offer some closing remarks? Well, I would just say that I hope it does not just become a benchmark, but draw others in, because the ambition that we have is way too difficult to do it alone. We need a rising tide to kind of lift all boats. We don't need the tide to rise because of, uh, you know, um, unnaturally high because of uh, climate change, but we need everybody to get lifted up by a growing, uh, by the growing momentum across the private sector. We, we approach this extremely humbly. We are just looking at the science, trying to put in place the corporate programs that will best align us with that science and then work with uh, all organizations, private sector and beyond to help us achieve our goals and help everybody achieve the similar goals. And as you know, Stanford has announced a school of sustainability that it'll launch. And so we look forward to working with you and, and Microsoft and many others. And, and thank you again for joining us today and to thank you for all of the people around the world. We hope you found this dialogue informative and relevant during these unprecedented times. Please join us two weeks from now uh, for a conversation with Fatih Birol, the Executive Director of International Energy Agency, on the implications of energy and climate on the world, U.S. policy, uh, energy and climate policy on the world. Again, please register on our website, gef.stanford.edu, and note the date and time. As of now, it's November 11th, 8.30 to 10 a.m. California time. But we are trying to figure out whether that's the right date or not. So please stay tuned and check gef.stanford.edu. We, we will now conclude our broadcast of today's program. Our, on behalf of the entire Stanford Precode Institute for Energy, we thank you for joining us and we will see you next time.